Mr. Chair, we wanted to obviously to invite other people, other institutions, not only Catholic. Um, we think that other institutions can be inspired, obviously, even by the words of Pope Francis and by, by the tradition, the Catholic tradition of reflecting on these issues from, from a more moral and ethical perspective. But at this point, I'd like also to, uh, and, and, and part of the, the objectives of this panel was also to bring voices from, from other uh, religious contexts. Uh, certainly, there are other Christian denominations which are present in the room, which, which would have interesting things to contribute. But I'd like to first uh, give the floor to, to Rabbi. Welcome, uh, Rabbi Klein, and we're, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Um, your Excellency, it's difficult to follow you, but I will do my best. But, uh, uh, Father, doctor, to everyone here, um, it's truly a privilege to be able to talk to people, with people who have committed their lives and their careers to take care of those who don't get hurt, uh, those who are stateless and homeless and is that better? Okay. Yes. So it, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. And I wanted to try to bring a Jewish context to this conversation. But I suspect it's not going to be a whole lot different than what you have heard and know and are going to hear. But I'd like to start from a slightly different perspective. When we teach, we're in a world today where uh, we, we approach things very dogmatically. Two plus two has to equal four. And in a standardized test, which most of our children are taking, if you write down anything other than four, you get it wrong. Even though two plus two equals five minus one. Two plus two equals 22. And I can go on with all sorts of other permutations. And there's lots of correct answers. But the system with which we, in which we educate, there's only one answer that we're going to accept. And if we get a different answer, then we're going to count it wrong and never give that student an opportunity to explain where his or her head is coming from in the process. But in a faith world, we know that you have to be able to think critically. And you have to get beyond the data that you're handed and then the, the question and answer. Uh, and if we don't teach our children how to apply the information that they gather through their education, then we've wasted their time and they've wasted their time as well. Um, as you've heard, it's, it's about remembering that we have to teach to the humane and not just to the grave or to the test. So critical thinking is at the forefront of what we're called on to do as people of faith and to be able to, to use and amalgamate all the information that we gather so that we can solve problems in this world. And education has to continue to be relevant. If it's what we've been taught for the last 20 years or 30 years, our world is a very different world. And people are facing very different problems today, very different circumstances. Uh, the world has evolved and devolved over this time. And what was a relevant education two years ago, in fact, three years, they say, is a generation in education. And if we're teaching today what we taught three years ago, for the most part, it's irrelevant. So it's no secret that the UN Refugee Agency says that there are 68 million displaced people in this world right now. And um, 25 million are refugees, and half of them are under the age of 18, which means we have children who are the people we're trusting with the future, who are stateless, who are homeless, and who are ignored in this world. And we have an obligation to do more. Angela Merkel said, um, she wasn't wrong when she said, if Europe fails on the question of refugees, its close connection with universal civil rights will be destroyed. So you cannot read the prophets in our biblical traditions. You cannot read the statements, whether it's my Bible, of just the Old Testament, or the Christian Bible, which includes the New Testament, or the Quran, or the Bhagavad Gita. You cannot read these texts without understanding that we are called on to change the world, to 
to take what we're handed in this day and age and figure out how to make a better tomorrow. And we fail in faith if we don't do something towards that end. And so the most important text, I think, in all of Jewish tradition, it's about 2,000 years old. It comes from the, the mission of the first attempt to codify rules of congregation in society. Um, it's from Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our ancestors. In Hebrew, im ein anili mili, uksha'ane la'atzmi ma'ani, ba'im lo'achsha ve'matai. Anybody translate? <laughs> um, the concept you'll accept and you'll understand. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what good am I? And if not now, when? So I have an obligation as a person of faith to stand up, to be counted, and to let people know that, that, that I have needs and I have responsibilities and that, that I'm part of society. But I can never do that in a vacuum. I can never do that without also standing up for the needs of everyone else around me. Because I've blasphemed before God if I have decided that my needs are more important than someone else's needs. And I can't wait till tomorrow to say, yeah, I'm too tired today, my back hurts, or I, my plate is too full. And I, I, I have to be able to be vigilant to do it all the time. And so, um, Dr. Ali Chaudhry and I co-founded the New Jersey Interfaith Coalition. And Dr. Chaudhry brought this statement to the State House in New Jersey, the Stand Up for Each Other Pledge. And while he brings it out of a Muslim tradition, it's, it's written right out of my Talmud. And it says, if I am with people of my own group, and someone in my own group stands up and says something disparaging of someone else, I am obligated in faith to stand up and correct that person right there. And if I don't, I've sinned. So everything in my Jewish tradition demands that we take care of the other. Um, the concept of tikkun olam, litakem et ha'olam, to repair the broken world. And this is going to be the Cliff's Notes, Cliff's Notes version of Isaac Luria's concept on creation. God creates this, this universe, and it's just chuck a blood full, okay? And then God has this amazing idea. He says, wow, there's this vessel of light, of pure light, that I want to create. And God creates this vessel of pure light and looks at this full universe that's stuffed already and tries to insert it into this full universe, and it shatters. And so God says, we need to restore the vessel of light. But the pieces are really, really small. So God creates us. And we are each those shards of light. And our responsibility is to heal the relationships, to create those that, that, that nexus between each other, to restore that vessel. And when your shard of light and my shard of light, and none of those are tied to being under the same religious label. We are under the same label. We are human. And to say that um, the difference in the religious traditions are somewhere hierarchical um, would, would, in my tradition, be a, a, a sole source of conflict. It's the same God. And for me to say that God only hears my Hebrew prayers, or candidly, and if someone says God only hears Christian prayers or Muslim prayers, then we've created a finite God. We have taken this infinite source of everything, which is beyond our human capacity to understand. And we've made it finite in our own little box. And that's such a struggle for people who, who are insecure in their own faith to really fathom and understand. Because somehow, if we're not really secure in our own, then we have to be able to be secure only at the expense of another. And that's at the root what we're here to talk about, and that's refugees. People who are displaced because they're different. People who don't matter because they're different. Who somehow are less in, less in the eyes of, of God than we are, because we're privileged to, to still have. And, and if we weren't privileged, we would be where they are. So Torah, 36 times in the Torah, we're told that we have to take care of the stranger. 
In fact, in one place it says that if you don't make the needs of the stranger more important than your own, you have sinned before God. So here's the conundrum. If you have two Jews, you have 12 opinions. Okay? And that's a joke, but it's not a joke. Because the Torah has no vowels and it has no sentence structure. And it can say lots of things. So in a Jewish context, you can never say, the Bible says. Okay? You know, where are you? And, and even if you had vowels, John is going to the store is a different sentence than John is going to the store. And commas save lives. Right? Let's eat grandma. Let's eat grandma. So... In a Jewish context, there's no one answer to any of these subjects. And that's why we have volumes and volumes of debates and commentaries. And on the one hand, you can look at it as being really divisive. On the other hand, you can see that there's never an end of the conversation. We always grow. At no point do we ever say we've solved that problem because there's the next way of interpreting and the next way of reading. And so we've got all these texts which say um, that you have to be you have to take care of the stranger. The problem is in how we'll define who the stranger is. And so in a liberal Jewish context, which is everything from modern orthodoxy through secular Judaism, you're going to find that the commitment to taking care of all of those who are the other, someone different than myself, um, is paramount. And stranger will be the refugee, the person, the homeless person who's, uh, who we walk by. You know, all of those people who are different than ourselves, including our next door neighbor who prays differently than do we. In a more orthodox world, you're going to find a different answer. In, um, in, in the farthest reaches of, of fundamentalism, they're going to argue that stranger is the new person who lives in our community who nobody knows. And you wouldn't be living in our community unless you were one of us just new to this block. And so I have to take care of the stranger, which means my new neighbor. And the rest of the people don't matter. That's an overstatement and that's an overgeneralization. But that's why if you do the work of, uh, of studying the position and, the, and the, the trauma of migrant life in a Jewish context, more often than not, far more often than not, you're gonna be dealing in a liberal Jewish world and not the ultra-Orthodox Jewish world. And our struggle is to figure out how to bridge that gap, which is something that we work on internally um, to, to make happen. Um, Talmud says, Talmud is about 1,500 years old and since. It's a compilation of commentaries, and um, in one place it says, These words and these words are both the words of the living God. Meaning that God can speak many languages and God has many different answers and allows for us to, um, to see and to grow. And in the context of education and in the responsibility that we have, we also teach that the dignity of our student is as dear as the dignity of our teacher. Why? Because if you're teachers, you know you learn a lot from your students if you're paying attention. And so, um, if I want to be relevant in the next generation, when I start teaching bar and bat mitzvah students at the age of 12, I sit them down and I tell them that day they become my rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. Because how am I going to know how to speak with a 12-year-old if they don't teach me and if I'm not willing to listen? That's when I talk about the continuing conversation. That's, um, that's how it fosters. So, um, I would only add further that in Judaism we have a word, tzedek, which gets translated in a lot of different ways. Tzedakah um, is, the, is the noun, and usually people will interpret it to mean charity. Okay? And in Deuteronomy, tzedek, tzedek, go justice, justice, you'll pursue it, or charity, there's a huge difference between charity, justice, and righteousness, but they really get to that one word. Charity is a nice band-aid. 
Um, my congregation this year around the high holidays brought in 4,000 pounds of food in an ingathering. It's a lot of food. But once that 4,000 pounds of food is consumed, what happens? We go back to our homes and people are still hungry. Justice, and oh, by the way, I need to warn you, I'm a recovering trial attorney. Okay. <laughs> um, justice is the rule of law. When you pass by the scales of justice, you're talking about the best answer that the current status of the law makes available to you. And so there was a time in this country that slavery was justice. There's been a time that discrimination was justice. And so the best reading of that phrase, tzedek, tzedek, tir, dof, is righteousness, righteousness you'll pursue. The best answer available, not the best answer available at law, but the best answer available. And um, so when we do the, the work of trying to balance society, we understand that we need to take care of the weakest amongst us, but we also understand we need to take care of security at home. We need to take care of, of fostering and nurturing the relationships with people who are like us, and yet at the same time in the morning liturgy, we're told that our obligation is to turn our enemy into our friend. Not to vanquish the other side, but to create the relationship such that um, one people with one heart, this world becomes whole. And I would go further to say that um, our vision of a messianic age isn't Jewish domination. It's the world has to be whole, all of it. And so, if I am in a rowboat, and there's a hole under your seat, neither of us is secure in that boat. And so, if for no other reason, and there's lots of other reasons, but if for no other reason that we are codependent on each other, we have to take care of each other, my tradition teaches at its very core that the dignity of my neighbor is, is, is paramount. So, Your Excellence, to the points that you raised, I would argue that the research that is necessary is to help us understand why we don't take care, why we don't care for each other. What's missing in our view of humanity when we look to each other, regardless of the labels of geography or demography or faith, culture, race, gender, why is it that we're not seeing each other? And that's where the educational process becomes so important beyond the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's to dignify the human. And to help people grow the skills that they can find themselves secure in their home or even in their new home. And to understand that migration is certainly uh, a right and a privilege, but also a curse and a horror and a nightmare. But whatever has happened yesterday can't control what happens tomorrow. And so wherever we find people, we have an obligation to make sure that they can flourish and be whole wherever they, wherever they are. And blessedly, amongst us, people who care, people who love absolutely, dignify absolutely. And of course, that leads to the third point that you raised, and that's the whole point of advocacy, that if, um, if we're not the ones to share this message of what's at stake, who's going to do it? And if, from a religious pulpit, I can't spread the word of what's at stake, and from the, the classroom podium or in the journals that we're writing, if we're not the ones that are speaking in loud volume as to what's at stake, not just for um, the present, but for the world order, when we start deciding that it's okay to ignore people or to affirmatively belittle people, um, it's going to impact all of us. So I, um, I tell people that you know, when we talk about a minimum wage, we talk about the need to sustain people in their jobs. The people who work 40 hours a week at minimum wage are earning below the poverty level. Working 40 hours a week. And then you have people who are trying to make profits in their businesses and they are paying that minimum wage and wonder why they can't get anybody to work in their business because no one can afford to live anywhere near their place of employment. And businesses are closing. Well, that's what we're talking about right here and now. How do we take care of those who are in need so that we can be taken care of as well? So that this world can be whole. And if there's one phrase that you'll take from a Jewish education in this, in this conversation, it's to repair the world.
And there's no boundaries on that. And there's no yet final answer to that. But I know that when that happens, it will be for all of us and not just some of us. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you.